All right, let's say our blessing together. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Elef Ha'olam Asher Kitvanu Shemotav Kitzivanu Ha'olam Bidibrei Torah Praise to you, Lord our God, rule of the universe, who's made us holy with your commandments and commanded us to busy ourselves with the words of Torah. So, well, our sheet is loading. Today, we are going to be learning about Kabbalah Shabbat. Um, so, I'll start us off with <laughs> first text. Uh, um, so, the question, when God plays tic-tac-toe with the Jewish people, which letter does God take? And, and the answer is the X's, because which could be translated as God will give O's to the Jewish people, or God will give strength to the Jewish people. So. David, you should put all these in a book. A that moment of humor. David, yeah. you should put these all in a book that you've written. They're so good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, Charles, would you read our Kabbalah Shabbat on one foot, please? You're asking me to read it? Yes. Ah, okay. Kabbalah Shabbat on one foot. Kabbalah Shabbat is a section of the Friday evening service. It's the very beginning prior to the evening service. Arvit or Ma'ariv, officially beginning with Bahu, it was developed by the Kabbalists in the city of Safat, in the land of Israel, in the 1500s as a way of receiving Shabbat, which is what Kabbalah Shabbat literally means. Hmm. I can't, I, I, all right. I, yeah. And, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so. We're talking about the first part of the Friday evening service. All right. Um, let's see. Morris, would you read our text and explanation, please? Could you repeat? Would you read our text and explanation, please? Yes. Yes, of course. Thank you. I'm you're muted, Morris. Morris, you're muted. Morris. <laughs> Morris. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. I'm sorry about that. All right. Rabbi Hanina would wrap himself in his garment and stand at nightfall on Shabbat Eve and say, Come and we will go out to greet Shabbat the Queen. Rabbi Yanni put on his garment on Shabbat Eve and said, Enter, O bride, enter, O bride. Between 1492 and 1529, Jews were kicked out of Spain, Portugal, Nuremberg, Bavaria, the Papal States, Milan, and Naples. Then in 1520, Schulemann, the Magnificent of the Ottoman Empire, conquered the, uh, the Egypt and the land of Israel from the Mar 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 Marmelukes. They, this led to a population explosion in Safat, Safed, as Jews from all over came to this city in the Galilee near Rabbi Shimon Bar Yachai's grave in Miron. Among those who gathered there was a Kabbalist, Rabbi Isaac Luria, known as the Ari. 
Around him gathered other Kabbalists, such as Rabbis Joseph Caro, author of the Shulchan Aruch, Eliezer, Elazar Azikir, Azikri, author of Yedid Nefesh, Moshe Cordovero, the leading Kabbalist before Luria, and his brother-in-law, Shlomo al Kabetz. They would all go out into the fields at dusk on Friday singing psalms and songs to welcome Shabbat. This custom spread to other communities, but they did it inside the synagogue just before Mariv, Arvit. Inspired by the text in a Babylonian Talmud, Shabbat 119a colon 2, al Kabetz wrote L'cha Dodi as a centerpiece of, for this new service. Kabbalat Shabbat, receiving the Shabbat, the Shabbat, he wrote it as an acrostic using his name for the first eight stanzas, Shlomo Halevi. Kabbalat Shabbat became the last universally accepted addition to Jewish liturgy. Hmm. All right. Thank you. So questions about the background of Kabbalah Shabbat before we dive into the text itself. Is that the whole service or just a portion? Ah, so Kabbalah Shabbat can be used to refer to the entire Friday evening service. Technically, it refers to the part before, Mar before Baruch. So the- oh, what? Before Barhu, so there's the regular evening service that's the same basically on Shabbat evening and holiday evenings and weekday evenings um, with a few additions for Shabbat. And then there's this extra section added beforehand mm -hmm. on Friday nights for Shabbat, um, which is mostly a set of Psalms and you do not fresh at the beginning and we'll have in the middle mm -hmm. and the more cottage at the end. So it's a it's the first half of the Friday night service, but some people use the term to refer to the entire Friday night service. What did they so do that, before this? Before this, I just did Marif. What is uh, Yadid Nefesh? Good question. Yadid Nefesh is a poem that has been set to various tunes, and it is the beginning of the Kabbalah Shabbat service in most Sidarim. Not every synagogue does it, um, but we will actually look at the text right after this. That will be the first piece of Kabbalah Shabbat that we look at. Thank you. Yeah. I got a question in the chat about whether you did, whether um, the Friday evening service or Mariv is complete if you don't say the Kabbalah Shabbat section. Um, and most people would say no. It's not, to my knowledge, it's not technically required, it's customary, which is why, and you don't need a minion for it, uh, which is why there are some communities like Shir Chadash or Shir Chadasha um, in Jerusalem where a woman can lead Kabbalah Shabbat, but a man has to lead Mariv. Um, so it has a different, and <clears throat> there are other communities where instruments will be used for Kabbalah Shabbat or will be used up until a Chad D, but not for the rest of the service. So Kabbalah Shabbat has a different status than the rest of the service. Um, two other notes about that. One is that 
when we have what's called a three-day yuntif, where you have two days of a holiday, and then right after that, we go into, uh, into Shabbat. We don't do a complete Kabbalah Shabbat because it's as if we are already in a joyous mood. Um, I think we start with Psalm 92 and skip everything up through a Chadar day. Um, incidentally, Psalms 92 and 93, as we will see, were done by the Levites in the temple. So it's possible that the, that before Kabbalah Shabbat became a thing in the 1500s, that these were being done as a way of welcoming Shabbat um, in memory of what was done in the temple um, as an addition before Barhu and before Mariv. Other questions about this? Um, Ah, there's a question in the chat about who decides what is accepted and what is rejected. Um, so there's a concept called the Mara Atra, which is basically the the person who is in charge of the community that is authorized to make halachic decisions for the community. Um, it's basic. What it comes down to is whose word will the community take for the decisions that they make, and it's usually the rabbi of the community. But different communities have different ways of making decisions. For instance, there are independent minyanim that don't have a rabbi but they still have to, or they have many rabbis, but no, nobody's acting as like the rabbi. So they have to come up with decisions about what they're going to do, what they're not going to do. And that is true of Jews, whether they're Ashkenazi, Sephardi, Mizrahi, whatever. Um, so Kabbalah Shabbat, news of it spread across the Jewish world. And it was something where Nobody seemed, nobody to my knowledge, I wasn't there at the time, <laughs> seemed to be able to find a reason not to do it. It seemed to enhance the goals of making Shabbat pleasurable, of welcoming it. It seemed to fit with what was going on. There was Talmudic precedent for it based off of the text that we saw. And so, and so communities individually and possibly influenced by other communities making this choice decided to accept it. Since that time, there have been, nothing else has been universally accepted as far as liturgy goes. Um, some of this has to do with modernity and a fracturing of authority. Um, there's never been a hope of the Jewish people, a central authority, but... Um, you have to hear. Oh, in no, the United States, right. there's no chief rabbi. Stop, stop. So there's no central authority in the United States, unlike you how there are in some other countries. Hit this. Yeah. All right. Other questions? Yeah. Um, David, since most synagogues have a mincha serve, have the afternoon service and run right into the evening service, mm -hmm. why is uh, this uh, Kabbat Shabbat service, couple of Shabbat service needed? Kabbat Shabbat is needed because Mincha is the afternoon service and on a Friday it's a weekday afternoon service. And it's lovely, but doesn't have the unique role of getting you ready for Shabbat, of setting the mood. So having this extra piece added to the Friday Mariv, the Shabbat Mariv service um, sets the mood. And since the idea is that it's Shabbat and we have more time, we can have a slightly longer service. We can have um, more tunes. Kabbalah Shabbat tends to be a very singy section. So Kabbalah Shabbat functionally works differently than Mincha does even if a congregation will do mincha 
and then go straight into Kabbalah, Shabbat, and Ma'ariv. Other questions? There's a hand up. David? Yeah. Isn't it also a nice example where one part of the Jewish world comes up with something which then becomes normative for any, for everything else? And this was the Kabbalists who wanted extra symbolism and then everybody's adopted it. I'm not sure this is even the, but what it just made me think of is when Debbie Friedman, who for the reform world started all these things and um, composed all these tunes and supposedly even in the Orthodox world, some of her tunes have crept into that world, though people don't necessarily know that it was a woman that composed them, but it's that same kind of thing when some in part of the Jewish universe, there's this lovely new thing and then everybody comes to embrace it. Yes, that is true. Um, possibly the closest thing we have to the universal acceptance of Kabbalah Shabbat would be the Debbie Friedman Havdalah, um, which is done by Reform Jews, Conservative Jews, Orthodox Jews, Ultra-Orthodox Jews, um, Jews in the United States, in Europe, in Russia, in Australia, in Uganda. Um, Jews around the world are doing the Debbie Friedman Havdalah tune. Um, and certainly in the orth in the ultra orthodox world, they have no idea that it was written by a woman and a lesbian to boot. Um, but they do the tune anyway. So it's it is indeed an example of something that has spread. All right. Let's look at the text itself. Barry B, would you read Yadid Nefesh, please? Um, sure. Let's Thank you. unmute. Hold on. Okay, great. I'm already on mute. Yep. Beloved of my soul, compassionate Father, draw me, your servant, to your desire. Would that I could run like a gazelle and bow before your beauty. For I find your love sweeter than honey or any delight. Beautiful, splendorous light of the world, my soul is sick with love. God, please heal her by bathing her in your serene light. Then she shall surely be strengthened and healed and be your servant forever. Uh, ancient one, let your compassion flow. Have pity on the child whom you love. For I have yearned so long to see your luminescent power. My God, my beloved, hurry, please do not hide. Please, my beloved, reveal yourself. Spread the sukkah of your love over me. May the whole world be illuminated with your glory. Then shall we be glad and rejoice with you. My lover, come quickly, for the time has come. Have compassion for me as in days of old. All right, and our context and question, please. Uh, sure. Uh, Yadid Nefesh was written by Elazar Azikri in the 1500s in Sfat, in the land of Israel. It describes a deep yearning for God. There are two versions of the words because we're Jewish, there has to be two versions. <laughs> <laughs> Because the original version was lost and later found. The original version has a lot of words that end in ach, while the version that guesses what the original is has words that end in cha. In this poem, the Piyutan religious poet has a deep yearning for God, similar to that of a person who is in love. When have you had a deep yearning for something? How would developing that yearning for God affect your relationship with God? All right, thank you. Sure, I, so I have a question about uh, further up in the uh, part that I read. If you mm -hmm. could scroll back up. So um, uh, 
little higher. Um, somewhere along the line, this switches gender. Mm. Yeah, so right here. Beautiful, splendorous light of the world, my soul is sick with love. God, please heal her by bathing her in your serene light. So it, uh, it kind of stood out for me. I'm not quite sure exactly what the poet is referring to unless this is part of the, the Kabbalistic view of Shabbat, of the Shabbat queen, perhaps, but mm. uh, not clear. I, I don't know if you have any other commentary. Sure. I'll throw that to the group, though. Yeah. When you when you guys see the word her, what do you take it as referring to? I'm thinking that the soul is sick with love. Oh, my soul. Can you can you heal her? I'm thinking about his soul. That's what's sick. David, I often think it's modern sensibility in translating rather than the original. But if it is in the original, wouldn't it be a Shekhinah reference of the feminine aspect of God related to the Mishkan where we've just been, we've just been doing all sorts of stuff about the Mishkan? Um, so let's see. Oh, no, it's, that's the wrong verse I'm looking at. No wonder. Um, so looking at the Hebrew and at the English, which happens to be a quote from the Torah, um, where the text is originally in feminine, it does appear that the Hebrew and the English would be referring to the soul, nafshi uh, cholat, avatah. So my soul is sick with love. God, please heal her. And is soul usually referred to as a her? I'm not, I'm yes, nishama. Oh, okay, got it. Interesting. Well, thanks. That clears up some of the uh, mystery around that. But. Yeah. That's what we're here for, to look at the English yeah. in ways that we don't usually when we're <laughs> just singing the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Although in this text, <clears throat> uh, the, there's a the whole image is between God, the Holy One, and one's soul as a romantic, almost romantic image. Mm -hmm. I've seen this prayer used at weddings as an expression of love between the husband and the wife. I've seen this prayer used when somebody gets engaged <clears throat> uh, as a way of honoring their love. So it has expanded to a more common romantic version as opposed to this illuminated version. Yep. All right, so I'm not going to play the clips for you now. You can look at them when I send the source sheet after tonight. Um, but we have here a Jewish a cappella group, 613, um, singing the tune Yeti, Itna, Efesh, Avraf, Aman, Meshoch, Avtach, Elritzonach, and so on. Um, so that is our example from that. Okay, Paul, would you read our next text, please? Psalm 495. Come, let us sing joyously to the Lord. Raise a shout for our rock and deliverer. 
Let us come into God's presence with praise. Let us raise a shout for God in song, for the Lord is a great God, the great sovereign of all divine beings. In God's hands are the depths of the earth. The peaks of the mountains are the Lord's. God is in the sea, the Lord made it, and the land which God's, which God's hands fashioned. Come, let us bow down and kneel. Bend the knee before the Lord our maker, for the Lord is our God, and we are the people God tends, the flock in divine care. Oh, if you would but heed God's charge this day, do not be stubborn as at Meribah, as on the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test, tried me, though they had seen my deeds. Forty years I was provoked by that generation. I thought, they are senseless people. They would not know my ways. Concerning them, I swore in anger, they shall never come to my resting place. <clears throat> Context. This is Palm 95. The Palm urges us to sing to God. How would Friday evening services be different if, all, if we only spoke the prayers? All right. They would definitely, um, I think they, they would still be really beautiful and they would have the potential for um, just a lot of really powerful connection with Hashem. Um, but at the same time, it might also become somewhat repetitive and, and maybe to a certain degree it would. Um, sort of I don't know maybe it wouldn't it wouldn't do um I think the same as it, as it would if we had been singing be, because it's sort of it's not really wel welcoming in the the Sabbath in um as powerful a way as it could with singing um thinking back to like in a temple um these psalms, I'm pretty sure, were actually sung, mm -hmm. by, you know, by by various different choruses of of priests, and having that in the synagogue not only enhances the the experience, but also harkens back to the ancient experience that we're participating in, in a for, in, in a sense, um, by having it being sung in the synagogue. Other thoughts? I just think the difference in the Friday night service, since we've added the uh, joyousness, you know, you asked before what gives you joy. I think I get so much joy on Friday night when we have a musical Shabbat. And it's just a sense of everyone being there together as a very spontaneous, happy Shabbat service. Hmm. It's also a chance for those of us who don't really read Hebrew that well or speak Hebrew to participate in Hebrew. Uh -huh. I think it reaches our soul. Mine anyway. <laughs> I also find it uh... It's easier to memorize a prayer if you sing it than if you just recite it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I think there's a tactile sensation that uh, is um, part and parcel of singing. Singing creates a vibration of the vocal cords and done correctly, it can basically vibrate the entire body. And so the actual sensation of having all of the cells vibrating at a given frequency um, to, a, to a set of words that are bringing a sense of release 
from a uh, business as usual workday consciousness to a hopefully a cosmic consciousness on Shabbat, that combination of a release plus the entire body of three trillion cells or so, however many are in the body, I haven't counted lately, um, that is only available with singing that quote unquote all of the organs all of the cells every part of my physical reality vibrating at the same frequency through a tune per se uh, that can only be experienced through song <clears throat> Oh, Steve? Yep. Yeah. Um, so, at least for me personally, um, the, the singing adds such a strong dimension to the prayer. In, in, in Hebrew, the word neshama is actually, uh, it means, among other things, it means like uh, breath, and wind and so on as well as the, your your soul and um you know, and the act of singing involves all of those actions at the same time the, to me it it the act of singing is is more of a direct involvement of what uh jews see as the soul in motion um and in the Torah, just uh, recently, we read about one of the most joyous occasions of the Torah when we crossed the Red Sea. And the first thing that Miriam did with the Jewish people was broke out, the, uh, she and, and uh, the Jews broke out in song. It was extreme ecstasy and joy. And um, yeah, I think we have a long tradition of music bringing us closer more in touch with our soul and in turn with god okay thank you sure <clears throat> all right David? so yeah go ahead well, when when someone is is reading the Torah, like like yourself or or Charles, for example, and you're reading the cantillation, so I mean, if it was meant to not be sung, the cantillation wouldn't be there, right? Mm -hmm. the, so, so yeah, I think that, go ahead. No, so I, so I think that's that says something, you know. I mean that that it was always meant to be sung. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, certainly as long as far back as the cantillation, the tradition of the cantillation goes. Um, it was written down in the eight hundreds, but uh, there's an oral tradition of it far earlier than that. Um, the cantillation functions as punctuation. So in the same way that the Nusach has musical phrases that help to just determine where the, the sense of the meaning is, um, to use a particularly graphic example, it's like the, the difference in the sentence, let's eat, let's eat grandma, whether you put a comma in before grandma or not. <laughs> so, the um the phrasing is important and makes a difference and the cantillation for the torah and the nusa musical phrases determine the sense of of the the syntax of the text that's very true All right, so we've got some examples here. 
This is um, the former ritual director of Anshayamit um, singing the Reuven Sorotkin tune. Lechun Iran in a lechun Iran in a lechun Iran in a ladunai. And so on. We've got 613 singing the Karlbach tune. Lechun Iran in a ladunai. We've got a Craig Tubman tune, which I am blanking <laughs> on. And then we've got Joe Buchanan, who is a Jewish country musician. Ah. Um, as in, he sings Jewish songs in a that he has written in a country style, um, and he wrote his own version of Luchun Aranana, which also has some English um, inspired by the Hebrew. Um, I think maybe he wrote this one for his son, so it's another version of Luchun Aranana. Oh, that's good. All right, um, Taibo, would you be willing to read Psalm ninety six, please? Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless God's name. Proclaim the Lord's victory day after day. Tell of God's glory among the nations, the Lord's wondrous deeds among all peoples. For the Lord is great and much acclaimed. God is held in awe by all divine beings. All the gods of the peoples are mere idols. But the Lord made the heavens, glory and majesty are before God, strength and splendor are in the Lord's temple. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of the divine name. Bring tribute and enter God's courts. Bow down to the Lord, majestic in holiness. Tremble in God's presence, all the earth. Declare among the nations, the Lord is sovereign. The Lord stands firm, it cannot be shaken. I'm sorry, the world stands firm, it cannot be shaken. God judges the people with equity. Let the heavens rejoice and the earth exalt. Let the sea and all within it thunder, the fields and everything else in them exalt. Then shall all the trees of the forest shout for joy at the presence of the Lord for God is coming, for God is coming to rule the earth. God will rule the world justly and its peoples in faithfulness. Okay, thank you. And our context and question, please. This is Psalm 96. The question is sometimes asked, how can you sing a new song to God when it's the same words that we sang last week? The answer that is sometimes given is that we've become different. So it's like or as if a new cover band singing the same song. What have you learned or experienced in the past week that has made you a different person? Thank you. And I forgot to turn on my appropriate background. So now I just did. Uh, excellent, thank you. <laughs> I think one of the things I learned in this past week when my friend Sally Brownlick had that terrible accident, accident in Friday and her daughter called me right away to tell me about it is that you never know what's going to happen from one minute to the next. And so it's more important for me to pay really close attention to everything that I do in the day, because who knows what's going to happen. And I think it was a eye-opening experience. Mm. And I had just talked to her that night before too. So you just don't, she was perfectly fine then. So I'll be a lot nicer to everybody, people. <laughs> Thank you. 
what have other people learned or experienced in the last, in the last week that's changed them? Hmm. <clears throat> My grandson taught me an interesting lesson. He ran a very important track meet last week and he didn't win. And I was wondering how he was going to feel. So I said to him, Ben, you, you ran a strong race. And he said, you know, it doesn't matter that I didn't win. I loved running it. Oh. Mm. And I'm thinking to myself, that's really important to love whatever you're doing at that moment. Right. Worry about the end result. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking too that unless something happened during the week that affected you strongly in one way or another week to week to week i don't think the singing this i mean the song doesn't doesn't have a different meaning for you um, you know it, it's it's what if you have something to apply it to that does in my estimation I can also say that with my beautiful voice, I never sing it twice at the same time anyway. Oh boy, got that right. <laughs> when I was in grammar school, the music teacher told me at the graduation from eighth grade, don't you dare sing, just mouth the words. So my whole life, you know, I didn't sing until we started with the musical Shabbat. And then I thought, too bad, I'm going to sing. I don't care if anybody likes it or not. <laughs> and nobody has said anything, so I guess it's okay. <laughs> All right, so our song here is from 613, and it's the Karl Bach tune. Shiru la donai shirfada, shiru la donai koha reds, and it goes on from there. And then we also have a text at the end of the psalm um, being sung here by Naomi Weisweil, um, which is Yismechu Hashemayim. Yesmehu Hashamayim, Hashamayim, Yesmehu Hashamayim, Hashamayim, and so on. Craig Tubman also did a Yesmehu Hashamayim, Yesmehu Hashamayim, Vatagel Haaretz, Yeraham Hayam, Umelo. And it goes on from there. All right. Um, go for one more. Gary, would you read Psalm 97, please? Okay. The Lord is sovereign. Let the earth exalt. The let the earth exalt. The many islands rejoice. Dense clouds are around God. Righteousness and justice are the base of the Lord's throne. Fire is God's vanguard, burning the divine foes on every side. God's lightnings light up the world. The earth is convulsed in the, light, in the sight. Mountains melt like wax at the Lord's presence. At the presence of the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim God's righteousness, and all people see the Lord's glory. All the worship, all who worship images, who vaunt their idols, are dismayed. All divine beings bow down to God. In Zion, hearing it, rejoices. The towns of Judah exult because of your judgments. O Lord, for you, O Lord, are supreme all over all the earth. You are exalted high above the, all divine beings. O you who love the Lord, hate evil. God guards the lives of the Lord's loyal ones, saving them from the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous, happiness for the upright, 
O you righteous, rejoice in the Lord and acclaim God's holy name. Okay. And if you would read our context and question, please. What do you make of the phrase light is sown from the right for the righteous, happiness for the upright? Thank you. David, I don't want to answer this question, but I'd like to ask a question. <laughs> sure. Um, in this psalm, and in one, in something that we read at the beginning of the class, it talks about um, other divine beings mm -hmm. that they bow down to God or whatever. But you know, these other divine beings are um, paying homage. I, for want of a better term, to the Lord. Yeah. And is this saying that there are other gods or that other that some people believe in gods that we don't believe in? Or what is, I, I'm just trying to understand this. Yes. So it depends who you ask um, what exactly this tells us about the ancient Israelites and their beliefs. Um, Minimally, it seems to suggest that the Israelites recognized that other people prayed to other gods with a lowercase g, um, but we think that our God is not necessarily better than all of theirs, but um, we're not buying their other gods, so to speak, not usually at least. Um, others see this as evidence that at one point the Israelites worshipped other gods or had periods of idol worship. Um, the term that's being translated is elilim. Um, there's reference to this in Michamocha also, Michamocha ba'elim Adonai, who is like you amongst those that are worshipped. Um, among, but some people translate it as um, who is like you amongst the gods. So different, different ideas about this. Um, it's hard to know exactly, but people have found evidence from archaeology and other such things um, and texts in the Bible to support their views. So, good question. Thank I'm you. going to propose that we revisit this psalm another time, um, recognizing the time. So I'm going to stop the recording now.